On this day in 1988, Frank McAvenny scored a double as Celtic beat Rangers 2-0 to make a flying start to their centenary year. The 2-1 win at Tannadice on Boxing Day had left Celtic two points ahead of second-placed Aberdeen and five points ahead of Rangers, who had a game in hand. Even at this stage, a win for Celtic would be a huge step towards the title. Alex Cameron wrote in the Daily Record on the morning of the match, Rangers go to Parkhead today knowing they daren't lose or their title hopes could be shattered. Victory for Celtic would hoist them seven points clear of their Ibrox rivals and very nearly uncatchable. Both of Celtic's rivals were strengthening their squads for the second half of the campaign, with Aberdeen close to agreeing a £500,000 deal with Arsenal to bring Charlie Nicholas back to Scotland, while the day before, Rangers paid the same amount to Aston Villa to sign Mark Walters. The first black player to appear in the Premier League, alongside Cameron's column that day, was a cartoon that proved sadly wrong in suggesting there would be no racist abuse of the player in Glasgow. Of much more concern to the newspapers was the behaviour not only of fans but the players after the previous meeting in October had seen the infamous Goldilocks and the Three Bears incident as well as Graham Roberts conducting the sectarian Billy Boys in the closing minutes of the 2-2 draw at Ibrox. Players of both teams had taken part in well-publicised photo ops together in the week leading up to the match and the front page of the Daily Record of the 2nd of January reported Celtic and Rangers are determined to prove today they can be friends as well as rivals. So the old firm teams will troop out together for the 2pm kick-off at Parkhead. Instead of going to opposite ends, they will mingle in the pre-match kickabout and, when they line up, continental style, to take a bow in the middle of the field, they will all shake hands in front of the 61,000 crowd. The new moves are part of unprecedented plans agreed secretly by old firm bosses in a bid to stamp out trouble on and off the pitch. The pre-match line-up and handshakes are standard procedure at all domestic matches today, but it was an innovation in 1988. Celtic would be without the injured Mick McCarthy and Peter Grant, and Billy McNeil sprang a surprise by fielding Lex Bailey, making only his second start in a three-man central defence, and for the first time went with the 3-5-2 formation that would be used for the rest of the season with fullbacks Chris Morris and Anton Rogan pushed forward to add width in midfield. Celtic lined up McKnight, Morris, Rogan, Aitken, Bailey, White, Miller, McStay, McAvenny, Walker, Stark, Subs, McGee, Burns. The day was marred by the horrendous racist abuse of Mark Walters at the hands of a significant portion of the crowd. There were also large quantities of bananas thrown onto the pitch in scenes that shamed the Celtic support. The best that can be said is that it was a one-off occurrence and roundly condemned without qualification by the club and the supporters' organisations. That's not to say individual fans have not shamed themselves since, but never again did this occur on such a scale. The star of the centenary season so far had been Paul McStay who was consistently delivering the kind of displays his immense potential as a teenager had always promised. This match was a huge test for him, pitting him against two vastly experienced campaigners in Graham Souness and Ray Wilkins. Alex Cameron wrote in his preview, Graham Souness is still Scotland's best central midfielder, but neither he nor Wilkins will be given the time on the ball they relish. The performance of Souness and Wilkins will be another key factor, with Paul McStay anxious to demonstrate he lacks only their experience. McStay did a lot more than that, with a virtuoso performance that completely overshadowed the Rangers pair and fully justified his maestro nickname. Apart from a few dangerous runs by Mark Walters, it was all Celtic, orchestrated by McStay, and the payoff came a few minutes before half-time with a breathtaking moment of magic opening up the Rangers' defence. Jim Reynolds reported in the Glasgow Herald on the 4th of January 1988. His was a performance to match the balance and grace of Nureyev, the gentle arrogance of Beckenbauer and the chilling accuracy of a hired assassin. 
He carved out Celtic's first goal in a moment of sheer brilliance, just as the referee was about to blow for half-time. Confronted by a couple of Rangers players inside the centre circle, Paul Daniels McStay sent them off in the wrong direction with an intricate little turn, then conjured a glorious pass to Chris Morris, who had made up so much ground on the right. In those couple of seconds, the Rangers' defence had been ripped apart, and when Morris sent in a low cross, McAvenny slid in to knock the ball past the helpless Woods. The score remained 1-0 deep into the second half, and 10 minutes from the end, Rangers goalkeeper Chris Woods was injured in a collision with the impressive Lex Bailey, and he was replaced in goal by Graham Roberts. A minute later, a Chris Morris free kick from the right was met by Frank McAvenny, out jumping Richard Goff and Co to direct a header out of Roberts' reach and in at the top corner. Happy birthday, dear Celtic, rang around the ground for the remainder of the match as they took a huge step towards the title. Jim Reynolds wrote, Celtic could not have begun their 100th birthday celebrations in a more spectacular fashion than they did on Saturday. It would have been enough for their fans in the 60,800 crowd just to have beaten their old firm rivals, but to do so in such comprehensive fashion, with pace, passion, flair and style, really put the icing on the cake.